weak institutional um, situation due to graft is that uh, four years ago, the French Navy seized a drug ship estimated at over $100 million and turned it over to the government of Liberia. The individuals who were all foreign nationals were arrested, detained, but released on bill of just a few thousand dollars for a consignment that worth millions in high currency. The accused, of course, eventually jumped bill. There was, as usual, talk of money changing hands in this case as well. Another instance is where a former minister of finance was serving as chairman of the board of directors of a state-owned company and he sold state assets, iron ore, to a private company on whose board of directors he also served as chairman. So you had a minister of finance, you know, a board of, chairman of the board of directors of this private, private company and symphony um, business and money to that. Of the estimated 15 million worth of iron ore sold, less than 1 million went to the state. Economic crime is equally and most seriously linked to human rights violations. Human trafficking, child labor, abduction, recruitment of children to fight wars, and even prostitution. Most often, when we speak of human rights, we only think sometimes of a person's civil or political rights. Human rights also relates to economic rights, the right of the people to equal health care, education, housing, and other forms of social services are often violated by officials who plunder state coffers. For example, recent census reports released by the Liberian Bureau of Census revealed that over 2.3 million Liberians live below the poverty rate of US $1 a day. I've already told you that. Liberia's maternal mortality rate is the highest in the world with at least between 800 to 900 deaths of every 1,000, 100,000 that gave birth according to a report from recently released from Mayo University Global Health Initiative. This can be attributed to inadequate health facilities and untrained medical practitioners, and of course the neglect of women's health by previous governments, and the um, diversion of meaningful resources that can go into institutions that, again, that can assist um, the people into the bank accounts of, of our leaders. Another example of economic crime being used as a catalyst for the violations of human rights is the, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you in the room will know, is the most popular case with the Sierra Leoneans, the blood for diamonds. And um, not only in Sierra Leone, but elsewhere, in DRC and other places in Africa where they've had such violent conflict. The, rob, the warlords and the financiers, when they go to bring war, they're looking into the the mineral rich area, they want to fight in the oil rich area, they want to be in the diamond fields, they want to be in the areas where they can export the timbers, and it's all about personal self aggrandizement Economic crimes also is uh, seriously linked to poverty. Perhaps, and perhaps one of the most vexing effects of economic crime on a society is the toll it takes on children who represent the future of any nation. In several wars around the, the continent, specifically in the Liberian situation, it was very, very appalling to see that not even the children were spared the, the tentacles of, of economic crimes. They also introduced the Poverty Reduction Strategy, PRS. And then, of course, of course there's the Millennium Development Goal where the government now has this giant work plan of tackling poverty, education for the girls' child, um, farm to market rule, microcredit for women, rehabilitation of former ex fighters, especially the, the youth and what have you. But notwithstanding, despite all of the above steps to address the issue of corruption, there seems to be a kind of hesitation, like I stated, on the part of the government to implement fully any measure of accountability of economic crimes. The decision of the government to introduce all of these measures must be backed up 
with the political will to actually implement what they say and not just write things on paper. Finally, uh, before I take my seat, I just want to give you just a little brief insight as to how economic crimes and the linking of the natural resources actually depleted Liberia and uh, brought the country to her knees. In 2000, Mr. Taylor, when he was president, passed the Strategic Commodities Act, which made him the sole power to execute, negotiate, and conclude all commercial contracts agreement with any foreign or domestic investor for the exploitation of, of strategic commodities of Liberia, including the timbers, the iron ore, and the gold, the coffee, the cocoa, the rubber thereby allocating the forest concession and other things at Mr. Taylor's discretion. Let's not forget that uh, Mr. Taylor was the major warlord. He had the largest faction with most support. And uh, he came to power, of course, he won the 1997 elections. Uh, but here he was, still fighting a war, and um, struggling to maintain his war machinery, and then here he was given all this exclusive right to um, oversee the entire natural resources of the country. As expected, in 2002, for example, the records of, of income, generating, uh, income that was generated from timber, for example, was 187 million that was exported outside Yet the government under Mr. Taylor at the time declared the timber's revenue for the same period of only 6.7 million. And uh, there are documents within Liberia and also other places to prove that the rest of the money went into paying for arms and ammunition and also foreign mercenaries to help him fight the war against other groups that came up as a result. I will stop here for now. I didn't focus too much on what I'm doing with the, our work with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So if some of you are interested in learning more about what the Truth Commission is doing or what it has done um, or the creating of the, the Truth Commission, please feel free <coughs> to ask a question and I will gladly share my own thoughts with you. I'm going to speak about the, the general tax consensus that facilitates multinational companies, how Ireland is part of that, using Ireland as an example, and the impact that this has on the developing world, which contrasts very much with Ireland's development policy and with our own, our personal attitude, I suppose, to how we see ourselves participating in the world and how we see ourselves participating particularly in development aid. So there is a kind of a tax consensus, as it is becoming increasingly known, which is the kind of OECD-based tax consensus, which pertains mainly in Europe, North America and Australia, which is based on the idea that for business, you will have low tax rates. Uh, businesses will be allowed to set transfer pricing, that's the rates at which they sell within the group, and there will be a network of tax treaties which facilitate multinational businesses in moving their profits from one country to another. So what I'm going to do is I'll speak about each of these in turn and then we'll talk about Ireland and we'll talk a little about the knock-on effect in the developing world. So speaking about low tax rates, low tax rates is a process that's sometimes called tax competition. A tax competition is the process by which companies reduce their corporate tax rate to as low as possible in order to attract in multinational investment. Now obviously companies have nowadays have locations in many parts of the world. Intel, for example, have 11 identical factories around the world. They're